Hello and welcome to News 360 from the News Hub here in Addison, we Accra. I am Issa Moni. And I am Aisha Yakubu. Top of the bulletin this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint, GT Bank, and Piccadilly Biscuits. Healthcare delivery under threat at Kintampo Municipal Hospital owing to damaged equipment. Traders at Kumasi Central Market counting their losses after fire ravaged their shops. On mission tonight, chips compound now a den for goats as pregnant women at Latinka and Kadani in the North Gonja district struggle to access health care. And on the international front, two men arrested in Northern Ireland over killing of a journalist during a riot. We have all the details, including sports and entertainment, coming up this hour. Stay with us as we begin the news right away. Lives of residents at Jato Chawi in the Krachi in Chumuru district of the Uti region have been characterized by persistent hardship. Inadequate provision of social amenities also remains a major setback to the development of the area. Jato Chawe is a settler farming community inhabited by few others and Inchimurus. It is located about 20 minutes drive from the Oti regional capital, Dambai, after one crosses the Oti River with Kinun or the Pantun. Agricultural activities have been their supportive occupation for years. Jato Chawe, like other neglected communities, for instance, is yet to benefit from the state-provided social amenities. Water, one of the basic necessities of life, is difficult to access. The over 600 people living in the community depend on only one borehole for all their domestic chores, even though it remains a polluted soil. They are convinced external support to the community would positively impact lives. If the government can come in to, to, to solve this lasting problem, I think Jatwe Crab will be one of the communities that will grow very fast. In 2016, electricity poles were erected to facilitate connection of a community onto the national grid, but nothing has been done since then. Parents say the situation affects education here as well. Learning the night is difficult. ICT is part of the uh, program that the, ch the children are learning. Because there's no light here, there's no ICT. I don't even know how the, 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 the teachers teach. Assemblyman for Jato Chawe, Nandi Napo, is equally worried about the state of the stalled project. I moved my vehicle and ran some people's vehicles and convened the push from Chindari to Marata era and we plant it. But now the contractor is not coming on the work. But any time I go to this assembly, I remember them with letters to them to know about why the contractor stopped the work. And I'm not getting feedback. At a town hall meeting organized by the district directorate of the National Commission for Civic Education, residents advocated for the prioritization of their needs. After several reports by TV3 on the poor state of the Ejisu Onri Bridge in the Ashanti region, work has finally commenced to fix the broken bridge. Ibrahim Abubakar reports users of the road are anxious to see early completion of the project to ease commuting within the municipal area. The Ejisu Onri Bridge links the town to farming communities was destroyed in March last year after days of heavy rains. Vehicles could not access the bridge, compelling commuters to alight at one end of the collapsed bridge. Commuters will then cross over on foot to the other end before boarding another vehicle to continue the journey. Timelines elapse on fixing the broken bridge. After a series of reports by TV3, a contractor has moved to site. 
A visit by the news team shows work progressing steadily to fix the bridge. Contractors have up to June this year to complete the project. Science engineer Stephen Ando says they are working day and night to meet the deadline. This is the main uh, river. We are facing some electrical problem with the water. That is why we are using the water pump. And we give us less than two months to finish the project. Users of the bridge are anxious to see the completion of the project. Looking at the women who used to be plying the road, they face many challenges like paying double their fares. And then I urge the authorities involved to expedite the work so that uh, everything will be in order. Because the bridge was broken, cars could not take us to our destination. We had to walk. Roberts also took advantage of the situation. And the 37th branch of the Ghana Private Rail Transport Union is accusing the La District Police of harassment and extortion. The drivers claim the La Police MTTD arrest and extort monies from them due to the absence of bus stops around the trade fair site. But the La Police denies the claims, blaming the drivers of converting unapproved areas into lorry parks. Here's a report by Peter Kwawadato. The Ghana Private Road Transport Union, GPRTU, alleged there were about five bus stops between Palm Wine Junction and T Junction. Unfortunately, these were eliminated in the re-engineering of the hitherto one-lane giraffe road into a dual carriage. The absence of the designated bus stops has created inconvenience for both passengers and drivers, leading to sometimes heated arguments. As a result, the drivers say they were compelled to stop at various bus stops, which have been eliminated from the engineering, to alight and pick passengers. And this is where their rules started. The drivers say the La Police take advantage of the no stopping signs to arrest and extort money from them on a daily basis. If somebody bought your car, you have to stop for the person. You can't take the person away. And then if you stop there, police arrest you that there's no parking there. Maybe if you are lucky, they get something from you and then leave you. Two drivers testified about their experience in March. They claimed the police escorted them to the office in La Town because they had refused to give in to their demands initially, an action the drivers regretted. Isaac Anemis told us they were forced to pay 1,200 and 1,500 tickets before their vehicles were released. <laughs> These claims were endorsed by the 37 branch welfare chairman of the GPRCU, Kweku Pong. There's no bus stop around those who arrest them. And if you arrest them, no, they collect money from them. And we went to the uh, LADMA, to the authorities to report them that they should do something about it. And they said, okay, they would just about one year now. They didn't do anything. Kweku Frimpong also pleaded with the police to help them persuade the urban road and the La Municipal Assembly to provide bus stops along the stretch. A drive through the stretch confirmed the absence of bus stops. Ironically, the opposite side of the road from T Junction towards Bema Camp has bus stops. The La District MTTD Commander of Police, ASP Ni Otukwe, admitted the anomaly in the engineering but refuted the extortion allegations. ASP Ni Otukwe challenged those who claimed to have paid money to the police to come forward to identify those officers. The issue of extortion, I don't know anything about it. Uh, so if they have uh, enough evidence to prove that this policeman or the other is the one involved, then if it comes to our notice, we'll take action. ASP Kwe again told the news team their outfit is liaising with the La Municipal Assembly to create bus stops along the stretch, but admonished the drivers against turning bus stops into lorry parks. 
Now, UN Senior Mediation Advisor in the Central African Republic and former Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister Emmanuel Bombande has observed legislation cannot be the optimal solution to ending political vigilantism in the country. He spoke to TV3 Selo Mamenya on the sidelines of a public lecture in Accra. The Attorney General Gloria Kufu on Thursday, April 11, presented before Parliament a new bill seeking to criminalize and disband all forms of political vigilantism in the country. This was after the President had asked the political parties to meet, but they failed to do so. The AG is asking the parliamentarians to, under a certificate of urgency, approve the Vigilantism and Related Offenses Bill 2019 that the government intends to use to end acts of violence perpetrated under the guise of vigilantism by the United Nations Senior Mediation Advisor in the Central African Republic insists the legislation alone is not enough. Let's be very clear. Every legislation equally demands that when the bill is passed and the president assents to it, it will call for enforcement. The legislative processes to ban vigilantism in themselves will be as weak as the political will to enforce them. Otherwise, you are trying to solve a problem by creating new problems. Because when the bill is assented to and it is not enforceable, it now becomes a new problem in addition to the fact that we have the vigilantism. He however indicated the decision of asking the two major political parties to meet to fashion out how to disband the vigilante groups was a wrong move, adding, this calls for a broader consultation. Dialogue to ban vigilantism, in my view, is a very first attempt. But its weakness is the assumption that the New Patriotic Party and the National Democratic Congress can meet, and out of that would come a, a, a resolution. Let's not kid ourselves. The best alternative is the dialogue process, but it must be inclusive. You're watching News 360 from the News Hub here in Accra. Let's go back to the Shanti region because the Asante Hin Utunfo Seitu II has cut soil for the construction of a nine story alumni hostel facility at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. The $70 million hostel is expected to help ease accommodation challenges facing the increasing number of students enrolled in the institution. Construction of the hostel facility is being executed by Safi Properties Limited on a build, operate and transfer agreement. The project is expected to be completed in eight months. The facility will accommodate at least 4,000 students when completed. Chief Executive Officer of Safi Properties, Samuel Fredia Ajiman, lauded the support of the Asantehini and the university management towards the project. The company will also be executing other projects on campus to give a facelift to the university. Asantehini, who is Chancellor of the university, also inaugurated a car park for the university as well as the renovated entrance gate. The events featured in the Chancellor's Day, organized by Nust in honor of Asantehini, as he commemorates his 20th anniversary on the Golden Stone. It's just a few hours to the Akwesida Keset tomorrow as the Asante He marks his 20th anniversary on the throne. Let's now go live to Mensha Palace where my colleague Nana Kwekwejia is standing by to give us live updates. Nanejia, what can you report? Aisha, so uh, we, I will be bringing our viewers updates on exactly what uh, is happening here. It's been happening for the past few weeks and and tomorrow is a grand finale. I can tell you everything is set for for us to go here in Mencia. Everything is set. Uh, the presidential days is over there. Everything is ready. I mean, you can see, um, although the weather is trying to uh, play tricks here, um, the storm is trying to raise, but uh, hopefully things will be there. So you can see the days over there and other uh, things to which ha have been put together. Uh, the chairs over to my extreme right are ready, prepared, so people are already seated. You can see what is happening around here. 
so we, we are ready if you ask me for tomorrow's encounter but let me let me quickly tell you Aisha who and who I expected here some dignitaries from uh, abroad I expected uh, the president of Suriname and the vice understand will be representing here some uh, dignitaries from the UK as well as the US will be coming as well in Africa we're expecting Olu Shiguno Basanjo the former president of Nigeria as well as some uh, other people uh, from Nigeria as well and locally president Kufuado is uh, the guest of honor here. Uh, we are expecting Honorable uh, Michael Kwe uh, here as well. We are expecting some parliamentary members as well here. And the chiefs, uh, Yana is, is expected here. Uh, the Dagbon, uh, uh, Wura is expected here. And also we are expecting the uh, other dignitaries as well to come here. So what is it that all is set, Aisha, if you ask me, to uh, welcome dignitaries here and other people here. The police, though, I spoke to earlier on here, uh, when they told me the uh, Menshia security will be dealing with it, the rec sec were packed here uh, early on. They had to uh, put them th themselves together. They had a meeting uh, in this afternoon to look at the crowd. People have complained about what to expect. Remember, it's not, it's no longer at their crowd sports, uh, Kumasi Sports Stadium. It is rather in Menshia. This is the first time. Uh, but what they told me is that they are very strong and ready uh, to contain uh, the crowd and also provide security. So I can tell you, we at TV3 will bring you the glitz, glamour, color, and we'll bring you the panache of what the tradition is and the culture and, and finish of everything you need to see here on TV3. Back to you, Aisha. Thanks very much, Nanija. Nanija is live at the Mensha Palace where the Akwesi Daikese will be taking place tomorrow to mark the 20th anniversary celebration of the Asante Hene. Right, let's do some more stories now. It's a very controversial issue. The Rastafari Council of Ghana is calling on government to legalize the use of cannabis in the country. They believe legalizing cannabis presents a lot more health benefits and would also create jobs. The Rastafari Council of Ghana has been advocating for the legalization of cannabis for years now. Its latest conference on the theme, Defending Our Human Rights, highlighted key health benefits of cannabis as well as its economic potential. The group is convinced decriminalizing the use of cannabis for medical, economic and recreational benefits is the way to go. President of the Rastafari Council of Ghana, Uhuma Bosco Okansi, said some ailments can be treated and managed by the use of cannabis. According to him, cannabis are beneficial in the healing of cancer, glaucoma, pain relief and many more, and it is a natural aphrodisiac without side effects. Director of Football at the Rastafari Council, Nana Kweku Ajima, noted that cannabis legalization in Ghana will attract huge investment opportunities and boost internal revenue. Also, cultivation and distribution of large-scale cannabis farms into production will curb emission and fight climate change. One kilogram of hemp today is 6,000 pounds, period. In the United States, and other countries, the development and the rise of the marijuana and the hemp business has moved so rapidly. This is a major game changer, a major game changer. And it's time now that government take us serious and start talking to us. The Women Commissioner of the Rastafari Council, Empress Safi Mawina, said that Ghanaians must capitalize on the benefits of cannabis than fighting against its use. Ghana is spending a lot of scarce resources fighting an innocent plant which can be cult cultivated and commercialized to provide alternative sources of income for farmers. It would be better to decriminalize the plant and channel all that money into improving healthcare delivery, education, and the plethora of socioeconomic challenges facing Ghana today. From the nutritional perspective, cannabis should be included in the list of superfoods alongside spinach, kale, and broccoli. Why? Because raw cannabis triggers the release of antioxidants, which effectively get rid of damaged cells in the body.
Lawyer for the Rastafari Council, George Tete Wayo, said the laws of the country should be applicable to every Ghanaian and not a sector of a society. Article 12 of the 1992 Constitution provides for the protection and enjoyment of fundamental human rights. It's a must. Thank you. Article 17 provides for equality before the law. No discrimination against race, gender, creed. So if one article says fundamental rights are a must, and one says you must not discriminate, then it seems something is not being done. And such forum is one that needs to send a signal to the government that if you have the laws, begin to recognize the laws. Now, lack of space, worn-out equipment, and other challenges are affecting delivery of quality health care at the Kentamport Municipal Hospital. The emergency unit of the hospital needs expansion and ultra-modern equipment to administer better health care services. AC Benua Otu visited the facility and has more. Welcome back to News 360. Let's do some more stories now. And lack of space, worn out equipment and other challenges are affecting delivery of quality health care at the Kentamport Municipal Hospital. The emergency unit of the hospital needs expansion and ultra-modern equipment to administer bet better health care services. AC Benoit Otu visited the facility and has more. The Kintampur Municipal Hospital is a 125-bed capacity facility and attends to all manner of cases. The hospital is the biggest health facility between Techiman and Tamale. Due to its location, it's a first port of call where accident victims are rushed to. And fortunately, the emergency unit of the hospital is not in good shape. Healthcare is delivered under difficult conditions. Due to the daily pressures on the facility, this walkway in front of the trauma ward has been turned into a major ward. Here is Haruna Seidu, a nurse practitioner of the hospital. This afternoon we had a, a trauma and there, was, there were just 10. So 10 on a, I mean a typical day fine, but there are days that we've had up to 40, 50, 60. And all of them have to come in here because this is the critical care and we only have um, two beds and then maybe two benches, you would say. And they are even not in the best of states. The only adjustable bed has broken. You can't readjust it if you need a different position too. So the space is really challenging. Try doing something. Yeah. If you have to um, raise it as you, if there is a weight on it, you. It, it will be tilting to one side at a point in time. So you, you, you cannot adjust the patient um, at one, I mean, when you need the particular. And then as soon as you send it up, it goes down by itself. The situation, he tells me, is even worse when other colleagues have to come in to support in emergency situations. When the hands come in and the space is too small, then you cannot move with the patients. And then you have about 10 patients, just four. Best. The rest of the six are on the floor, and then there's blood everywhere. You cannot step on. You are not able to give the appropriate treatment, as in giving them infusions, and then um, the appropriate movement cannot be made. So that affects care very much. When you have hands, then there's no space, and when you actually don't even have hands, then there's a lot of casualties that you have to deal with. At a time of visit, we saw a lady who was involved in an accident lying on one of the beds at the trauma room waiting to be referred to a different hospital for specialist care, but had to wait for an ambulance first for about three hours. Medical superintendent of the hospital, Dr. Gavin Apiu, said the hospital in such cases uses its resources in taking care of patients. Once it's a rescue mission, you have to use the resources and then later hope for reinvestment from either the clients or their relatives. Quite often than not, this does not happen. So resources are used. You use gauze, gloves, etc. on patients. And once they are referred, 
that is the end of the story. The bill is on the books pen. So we are happy when we get the support of members of the community or others who give us any, um, any, any form of support by way of supplies, etc., that we can use for this, um, our work. The acting Kintampo North Municipal Director of Health Services, Alice Villatu, indicated the hospital lacks basic necessities for its smooth operations. Presently, as we are talking, we have three medical offices and they are inadequate. The number is inadequate. And then we don't have ambulance. So when there are cases, we have to call all over Brunhafo as far as Sampa for them to come down. When they come, they fall in and out alone. It's a headache to the municipal assembly. Then the, the Ghana ambulance service, their ambulance too is weak. She noted our promises to get the challenges addressed has not been fulfilled. Yeah, politicians have come anytime such things happen, they promise and then when they go we don't get anything, nothing from no response from them. The hospital as at now is not having even a pickup. The directorate was sharing its pickup with them and now that one too is down. According to the SDG health price tag, Investment in health systems could prevent 97 million premature deaths by 2030. And situations like this should be urgently attended to. AC Benewa O2 TV3, Kintampo. Let's move slightly downside to Kumasi because parts of the central market were gutted by fire late Friday. About six fire tenders were used to douse the inferno. Here's a report by Beatrice Piogabra. Fire gutted this portion of the central market about six years ago. Just after the fire, the traders reconstructed their sheds and shops, despite calls from the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly for them to stop. Six years down the line, fire has again gutted the place, throwing scores of traders out of business temporarily. The cause of the inferno is not immediately known, but sources say fire personnel had a Herculean task to put out the fire. At the scene on Saturday morning, some of the affected traders were seen scavenging through the debris to service some of their goods. The affected traders deal mostly in second-hand clothing, socks, underwear, and foodstuff. Some of the traders spoke to TV3 News. The traders were also seen busily clearing up the bent clothing to restart their business. Meanwhile, the Kumasi Metropolitan Chief Executive, who visited the site, disclosed work will commence on the second phase of the redeveloped Kumasi Central Market project on May 2nd. He was hopeful a modern market will help reduce such fire outbreaks. You're watching News 360 and coming up next, Mission. It's now time for a mission and a mission tonight. Expectant mothers and newborn babies at Latingpa and Kadeni in the North Gonja district of the Savannah region still struggle to assess health care. Stanley Niblo reports a chief's compound to serve the primary needs of the people is now a shelter for goats three years after completion. Pregnant women at Latingpa and Kadeni for years have been going through difficult times to assess health care, especially when labor sets in. 
In September last year, a crew from TV3 visited the community to report on an abandoned community-based health planning and services, CHIPS compound, constructed to facilitate the provision of basic health care to the inhabitants. The crew chanced on a pregnant woman in labor being transported on a motorbike to a health facility at Bunjai, about 20 kilometers away, to deliver. This was after the community's traditional birth attendant could not handle the situation. The life-threatening journey was done amidst bad road. The situation Azaratu went through is what all pregnant women and the sick have had to endure. After that painful labor on a motorbike, Azaratu finally gave birth to twins, one boy and one girl. But the problem that still persists is that when these children are sick, their mother is compelled to carry them on a motorbike to assess health care at Bunjai, some kilometers away. Azaratu was not comfortable with the experience. Before I arrived at Bunjai on the motorbike, the pain I went through affected my waist and made the delivery difficult. The situation here is disturbing and it has to be addressed. In October last year, after TV3 had reported on the situation, Municipal Chief Executive for East Gonja, Muhammad Tamin, assured residents of commissioning the chief's compound in four months. He told the mission team procurement processes for equipment to stock the facility have been completed and the supplier was ready to deliver the items. We have made provision for the finishing of this cheap compound in our 2018 budget. They were not budgeted for at all. So I did that and we have finished with the procurement processes and the supplier is in the in in in, in is almost ready to supply these uh, equipments you find one or two of the cheap compounds in a bus state we are ready to fix them and uh, get these equipments in there and get them uh, operationalized eight months on nothing has been done and the supplier has also not delivered the items goats continue to inhabit the structure the deteriorating state of the ceiling has also worsened. Assemblyman for Latinpa, Mahamadu Mahama, blames politicians for the neglect. When you came here, before we, we talk about it, this year called me and said that I didn't tell him about the Kipompa to do it. And, what I, and when I, I didn't tell him, and you come and I said that he didn't do anything, I went to spoil his work. So... How I done is not good for, for him. There has been a new development. Just now they, they, they divide the district. So we are now settled off now. And we had our DC now. Maybe I will go and tell our DC and he also look for it. That's how I went to do now. Municipal Chief Executive for East Gonja, Muhammad Amin, when contacted, confirms the partitioning of the municipality, adding that the Lantinkpa Chips compound is no more within his jurisdiction, and so the facility would be one of the liabilities that will be passed on to the newly carved district. He again said, resources and logistics procured to stock the Lantinkpa Chips compound would be used to furnish other health facilities in the municipality. Road linking Kadengi to Lantinkpa which was washed away by flood, has also not been rehabilitated. Another chips compound at Yayayili in the East Gonja municipality also suffers the same fate. Here, doors and frames have been dislodged from their positions as a result of termite infestation. Residents of Latinpa, Kedengi, Yayayili and adjoining communities are calling for stringent intervention to address their health care needs. Stanley Nibleu, TV3 News, Latinpa, North Gonja, Savannah Region.
Now, teachers at the Bola DA Primary School in the Pandai District of the Northern Region continue to abandon classrooms for farming. As Stanley Nibleo reports, the fate of pupils hangs in the balance as they are not taught by teachers. In September last year, the mission team visited the Bola DA Primary School, situated at a strategic location in the Bola community. The school provides formal education to close to 100 pupils, but teaching and learning is not effective as teachers, who are the main stakeholders, do not regularly attend school. As a result, pupils are losing out. The mission team's investigations reveal that district authorities do not frequent the area to undertake monitoring activities due to the long distance they would have to cover from Pandai, the district capital. This has given teachers the luxury to stay away from school and deprive pupils of their right to education. During our previous visit to the Bola Basic School on a Monday morning, pupils had reported to school in their numbers. However, there were no teachers at the school, and so pupils were whiling away instructional hours, playing football in the classrooms. At midday, when no teacher had still reported, the pupils went home. The head teacher, Abaraka Rahman, who was accused for allegedly embezzling PTA dues, later approached and wanted the reporter to kill the story. What are you suggesting? That I shouldn't do the story at all? So now we are pleading. That I shouldn't do the story at all? So that? That one, that one will not work. If any cost, we can bear, we can bear it. That one, we will be very happy. After TV3 went ahead to broadcast the story, Abarukara Man was transferred, leaving his colleague Brian Mafuseni in the school. Two other teachers were then posted to the Bola school to support Brian Mafuseni to run the school. With this change, parents have high hopes in anticipation of improvement in teaching and learning, but this has turned to be a mirage. On Friday, March 29th this year, the team decided to go back to the school and ascertain what has changed since our first visit. Although afraid, the team still had to go. Riding for about two hours, the team finally arrived in the school. To our amazement, the team met an empty school as at 9 a.m. Our investigations in the community revealed pupils reported to school but they were compelled to go home because teachers did not come to school. Teachers of this school are constantly demonstrating the habit of not coming to school. Today is 29th March 2019. It's a Friday and pupils are supposed to be in school, but they have all gone home simply because there are no teachers to teach them. The pupils said, that was the second time their teachers had absented themselves from school in a week. We guarded one of the teachers, Brian Mafuseni, after shunning class, came for three of the pupils and sent them to his yam farm. This was confirmed by the chairman of the Parents Teacher Association. The teacher did not inform me before sending the pupils to the farm. We will ensure he's been sermoned to explain why he had to engage the pupils on farms. In the evening of the same day, the team met Brian Mafuseni in town with a friend. When the team approached him, he told the mission team he did not go to school because he feels a burning sensation in his heart but has never bothered to seek medical attention. District Chief Executive for Pandai, Emmanuel Atta Tatablata, said issues of teacher absenteeism would be addressed. We need not to rush. We need to take our time so that we don't step on so many people's tools. In the attempt of doing the right thing, we don't step so many people's tools. You must step, but it should be in a gradual process. Pandai District Education Director, Nayan Faustina, is yet to visit the school. Achieving the universal access to education and lifelong learning in Bola would require stakeholders' commitment. The Ghana Education Service must also intensify its monitoring, especially in the hinterland communities, to guarantee equal access to education for all. Stalin Nibliu, 
TV3 News, Bola, Pandai, Northern Region. Quite an unfortunate development there, but that's all for Mission Tonight. Mission is brought to you by Star Ghana with funding from Danida, UK Aid and the EU. Now right in this segment tonight, Grammy Award winner Adele Laurie Blue Atkins, popularly known as Adele, has separated from her husband, Simon Konecki, Representatives for the singer have confirmed the news. The pair married in a secret wedding in 2016 and are blessed with a seven-year-old son. In a statement, the representative said the pair were committed to raising their son together lovingly and asked for privacy in these tough times. The singer's debut album, which was released in 2008 and featured hits including Chasing Pavements and Hometown Glory reached number one in the UK. She went on to win a string of awards and her follow-up, 21, topped the charts in 30 countries, including the US and the UK. Now, international gospel hit maker Tim Godfrey and UK-based Ghanaian gospel artist Diana Hamilton tr uh, treated fans to soul-inspiring gospel tunes at the 21st edition of Harvest Praise. Now, the show was held at the Fancy City's home at the Trade Fair Centre. The Fantasy Dome was a place to be on Good Friday as believers gathered in their numbers to celebrate through music. Word administration, among others, of this year's Harvest Praise, the annual event now in its 21st year, treated the audience to a memorable gospel night with back to back soul winning songs from gospel artists and the Harvest Gospel Choir. The overgreen gospel sensation Diana Hamilton refreshed the minds of audience with some old tracks and ignited auditorium with her current tracks. From Nigeria came the worship dynamite, Tim Godfrey, who put up a soul-inspiring performance. It was a heartwarming moment when Tim Godfrey and his Nigerian crew performed the song in the Ghanaian dialect. Some patrons shared their views about the event. I have loved it and it's amazing because this is the way you can worship the Lord. It's been nice and it's been awesome. I was expecting something great and I've not regretted coming. It was great, it was exciting. I've come two or three times, but this was really wonderful. The Nara Hitmaker gave words of encouragement to the youth, especially young gospel artists. Every young person there trying to um, start up a career, keep doing what you're doing, keep getting better. Um, Joseph dreamt that he ruled, he became a king. He became the leader of his family and all of those things. And after he dreamt it, the next place he saw himself was in a hole. The next place he saw himself he was sold. The next time he was in a prison. It didn't happen immediately. There was a process. And there's a process for everything you want to become in life. You can't just there's you can't just skip process. If you skip process, you come down quickly. Some entertainment stories tonight. An exciting four-day festival dubbed Onya FM Jekiti Easter is underway in the Sojamine district of the Eastern region. The enthusiastic tourism drive, spearheaded by Onya 95.1 FM, is in its third year. We go job life. Crowd enthusiasm is picking up ahead of Onya FM Easter Happy Hour, Boat Ride, and Lakeside Beach Jam. Patrons are thronging in from far and near to be part of the historic event. On Saturday morning, Team Media General blended in to enjoy a heavy homemade breakfast of banku with fried fish and pepper ahead of a full day of football gala, free health screening and happy hour. The annual event has opened the ancient town to booming business, displaying multiple wares for patrons to choose from. Nana Manfi Utuaben III is the chief of Jekiti. He could not hide his excitement about Media General's involvement in their jubilee. 
Head of Entertainment, Event and Lifestyle at Media General, Kenneth Addo, indicated that the best of the festival is yet to come. We're excited and of course we are going to make sure that uh, we deliver on our promise as we have to Acting head of station of Unia FM 95.1, Bright Kwesi Asempa Chadide, expressed confidence about preparations for Easter Monday's Big Jam and promised patrons a great show. Tom, um, looking at the expectations that people have, and those who are yet to come, the call that we have, uh, it's obvious that we can prepare very early, uh, so that when the people come, everything will be set, and that's why we do know that. Mm -hmm. Some patrons also shared their joy ahead of the happy hour at the Adowa nightclub. It's an exciting day, a marvelous day. All we can say is thanks to Unia FM and TV3 for coming to Jakiti. This is where we come from. This is our hometown and we love the place. It's something else like... We are having fun, le, le, yeah, we are having fun. <laughs> and that's the mood and feeling here at Jackie Team. You can't get it wrong, two days gone already. Tonight, we're meeting at Adoa Nightclub. Tomorrow, it will be an exciting boat cruise. And then on Monday is the Big Fat Beach Jam. You can't miss it. Johnny Hughes, TV3 News, Jackie Team. Right, so here we come, Jackie T. <laughs> Two days more, we'll be there, and the cameras will bring you all the shots right from there. I'm Issa Moni. Thanks for watching. And I am Aisha Yakubu. Have a good evening. <laughs>